Hello everyone, I am Rujandu Paul and today I will be talking about my paper on creating an automated forex currency transaction forecasting process for global e-commerce and fintech companies. To give you a bit of background about this process, as e-commerce and fintech companies have had operations across multiple countries uh, with more globalization, and they have also had to deal with currencies that are non-US dollars. In order to deal with the currency transactions risk, they have a dedicated finance and treasury team who essentially create those forecasts and then make sure that they are executed the next day so that at any one point of time, the company is kind of hedged for those currencies through Bloomberg or Reuters terminal. And the challenge is the finance and treasury teams typically have a non-machine uh, learning background. So, so therefore they are using mostly linear models such as moving averages or arimas or sarimas and these are often not able to capture the non linearity in the trend of the data. And therefore the accuracies might be lower and machine learning. So in this case, I'm proposing a machine learning based approach that is automated and that can create forecasts for any number of currencies the company has operations in and we can run those models individually for each currency so it has higher accuracy for each one of them as with any machine learning model it starts with data collection process and in this case based on the hypothesis and discussions with the forex and treasury teams we think that historical data would be most relevant in this case then of course we have regional holidays now based on the currency and the country uh, for which we are trying to predict the transactions for regional holidays would be significant. For instance, in the US or the UK, Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays have a significant statistical power in predicting the transactions volume. Similarly, uh, for, for Chinese New Year, it's a significant holiday for the Asian countries where we have significant transactions volume for those, for those currencies. Then, of course, to uh, let the model learn about some of the macroeconomic regime uh, we can also have some of the macroeconomic variables such as inflation uh, inflationary factors recessionary variables as part of the model so the model can pick up trends from that and do a better job in predicting those transactions finally the there are time-based features that we can create using the date column and those can be some in the lines of the day of the week which often have a significant impact on the volume of transactions we can also have seasonality factors such as month of the year the peak of the year to factor in the additional seasonality that the model can uncover based on past data. And then of course, we create a data engineering pipeline so that we are really creating the forecast for n days ahead. And this n value here can be parameterized. So we can create either the next day forecast, three days ahead forecast or five days ahead forecast. Now that's critical because suppose we have a holiday, then the finance team can always schedule, uh, schedule them to run three days ahead or five days ahead forecast. So then, um, so then they can use those values. They don't have to work on a on a holiday to plug those numbers into Bloomberg's or Reuters terminal. They can use those values from five days ahead um, to kind of um, let make sure the transaction does execute real time and they are always dynamically hedged um, for, for, for those currency transactions. And in this case, we have for model selection, I have those experiments for uh, experimentation using multiple machine learning models and use cross-validation technique to make sure that their performance um, is in line. Uh, with what the stakeholders have expectations for, at least at the minimum bar, and then how they are doing on the validation set. Now, of course, then uh, since we are using multiple lagged values, um, so we have individual machine learning models, the best machine learning models for each lag period, and then we're creating an ensemble of that. So the combined model has a higher forecasting accuracy here. Model architecture. So in this case, as I mentioned, now we have we might have more than twenty different currencies where the company has operations in and so for each of those currencies we will have a separate machine learning architecture like this so the model is going to run at scale and it's hard to predict which lagged value is going to be significant for that particular currency for that particular period right so what we have proposed here is taking the at least a week's worth of data which is six periods in this case and then using multiples of that in this case i have used 12 24 and 48 and then um, i've tested this with multiple machine learning models an XG boost model essentially gave the highest accuracy in more than 95% of the cases. So that was selected as the key model for each of those individual pipelines. 
and then I'm ensembling those models to create the end days ahead difference um, with uh, with today's value. And then the latest transaction volume that we have available, we are adding this value together and then we arrive at the end days ahead forecast. Now this is model architecture will be used for each transaction, currency transaction that the company wants to predict. And essentially this, this is highly scalable and this can run in parallel to each other because individual currencies are independent of each other. Now moving forward to the process workflow. So I think I already mentioned about the data collection piece. If you have historical data, the regional um, qualitative data, and of course the macroeconomic factors. Then of course we have data pre processing. I think that is very crucial in this case. The data needs to be clean. And of course for some of the holidays, we might not have any transactions data. So we need to have those data, even if though the values are zero, we need to have those to ensure the model is learning from them and it is able to predict accurately in the subsequent years. And of course, there are sales data, transactions data, there are continuous data that needs to be normalized. Then we have several categorical data, such as the, the time-based features, then we have the holidays. So they all of them needs to be encoded so that we have we are handling the categorical variables um, in the in the right fashion. Then we have data transformation. It's important for machine learning models to not have any trending data as an input, rather we should be using a detrended data that is stationary. So we are using a right kind of data feature trans data transformation technique to make sure we are using stationary data for our models. And of course, we can use certain feature engineering techniques based on discussion with the stakeholders, the finance or the treasury teams to make sure if there are any relevant features that we can extract from the data as well. And, um, and, and that will be driven kind of by the ETA uh, before we um, create these machine learning pipelines. Then we have several time-based features as which are already kind of covered already. And then of course, now, since we still have so many different columns, and if the size of the data, the data that I used has like at least four, five years of data, if the data size is smaller, we might have issues of high dimensionality problem where the number of rows of data are kind of almost similar to the number of columns that we have. So in those cases, we can have apply PCA, principal component analysis, and we can apply the 80-20 rule where we can select the top 20% of the variables of the PCA that are explaining 80% of the features in the data set. That will reduce computation time, computation complexity, and also the predictive accuracy might also go up because of the reduced noise in the, in the data. And then of course, with the modeling technique, we are using traditional models like ARIMA, SADIMA, and moving averages to benchmark how the models are doing versus these kinds of benchmark models. Then we have machine learning models already discussed this step. We're ensembling those and producing the end days ahead forecast. Finally, we come to the two most important steps, which is the training and uh, model validation step. We are using cross-validation using a training set to train the data, the validation set, create those forecasts and and, and and evaluate how the models are doing in those validation sets and also make sure that the data is not overfitting on the training data set. And finally, test set gives us an accurate estimate of how the model would be doing in the real world once it's put into production. And of course, it's important to note here that this is time series forecasting. So rolling window forecast needs to be used. So we are always factoring in the latest data to create any kind of forecast, even in the validation set. And then we are using evaluation metrics like RMSE, MAE, and MAPE. Now RMSE gives, uh, penalizes the extreme values in the errors even more. So we need to be aware of that. MAE whereas gives equal weightage to all errors. So if the data has a lot of, some of the currency transactions have a lot more fluctuations in the, in the, in the transactions volume, we might be using MAE in that case. And MAP is a very good metric because we can compare one, one period to the other and, and use the MAP as a percentage metric, which we can normalize and across, compare across different currencies as well to make sure that how the models are doing for each individual currency pair. And finally, we have come to the important piece of automation and operationalization, where we need to integrate these machine learning models to with the finance or the treasury system. So we are pulling the right data at the right time. And there are access issues in a company to where the finance data is safeguarded. So we need to make sure that developers do have access to this data. Then we can use MLOps or CICD pipelines to make sure this process is runs every day in an automated fashion. And then of course, we can involve the data scientists or the business analysts to build those data uh, data monitoring dashboards um, so that we can uh, understand how the models are doing over time and also if there is any drift in the in the input data or in the model performance over time. Finally, we come to the results and the discussions. So this is where we evaluate the performance of the automated forecasting process. Now the approach that I've presented here, I implemented that in, in the companies that I've worked for in the past and it had 
a lot of success. So I saw like a 25% improvement in terms of predictive accuracy compared to the linear models that the finance teams were using. And there are significant benefits to that on every level of the business. So uh, first of all, the currency transaction exchange risk is significantly reduced, right? Number that's number one. Number two, if we can predict the transactions volume more accurately, in that case, the error reduces. And so the profits that the company makes from those transactions, because they are consolidating those transactions and then executing them on the platform real time. So by getting a better rate, the company actually profits from those transactions ahead of time um, by having those on the system ready. So that's another aspect. And, and usually companies with global operations, they usually have billions of dollars of foreign currency transactions revenue. So imagine even a 10% lift in terms of error, that will improve significantly the profitability of the company. And then we have the relevance of the models for significant calendar events. So for instance, the holidays might have a lot more importance, which the Arimas or Sarimas might not be able to factor in. The machine learning models based on statistically significant factors might actually put more weight to some of those holidays compared to others. And that might improve the forecasting accuracy. And another key thing is the benefits to employees. Now, if we are just producing a, using a manual process where producing, we are producing the next day ahead forecast, the challenge with that is somebody has to work on a holiday to, uh, to plug in the numbers for the next day, right? Which kind of impacts the employees at a personal level. So by using these machine learning models, using a three days or five days ahead forecast, we can use um, some of those capabilities where the employee plugs in those numbers, even on a, on a weekend before going on to the holiday and they execute real time and we know how much accuracy we can expect for those forecasts compared to the next day ahead forecast. Finally, we come to limitations and future work. So in this case, I have used linear regression models with ridge and lasso regularization techniques. I've also used tree-based models um, such as random forest, XG boost, and so many other variables that are listed on the workflow here. Um, some of the things that we can do here is potentially apply deep learning models, which can give us uh, higher accuracy, but we need to be aware of the fact that they can easily overfit the training data sets. So uh, hyperparameter tuning needs to be done really well. And also deep learning models can have several different hyperparameters. And given if the size of the data set is really small, need to be cognizant of that fact as well. Um, some of the other techniques that we can use are the um, reinforcement-based learning techniques. Now these are harder to implement given that ultimately in the end, the finance and treasury teams who are the main stakeholders for this project, they need to adopt that process. So with reinforcement learning, it's a black box model. So interpretability can be a challenge. So just need to be aware that explainability is something we should, we are able to factor in uh, while presenting those things to the, to the stakeholders so they can be adopted and can be operationalized as part of the day-to-day -day operations. Thank you.